This is a video about limerence, specifically what it is, how it's probably ruining your love life. And towards the end of this video, I'm going to interview someone who might just have the key to overcoming it. Now, if you want to understand anything about limerence, you first need to understand who this woman is. This is Dorothy Tenov, the person who's most closely associated with coming up with the concept of limerence. Now, limerence is a term that was first coined in her book, Love and Limerence, The Experience of Being in Love in 1979. It describes a state of mind where someone is obsessively infatuated with another person and is constantly thinking about them to the point where it impacts their daily life. So I'm gonna level with you. This definition kind of confused me. After all, what is the difference between limerence and just having a normal crush on someone? I mean, aren't they sort of the same thing? Well, yes and no. Well, it's true that limerence and having a crush on someone are both feelings associated with romance. They differ significantly in terms of intensity, emotional depth, impact on your life, and duration. Think of it like this. Let's divide these four concepts, intensity, emotional depth, impact on your life, and duration up into four quadrants. All right, now that we have them divided into quadrants, let's look at how limerence and a simple crush differ in each of these categories. In the intensity quadrant, limerence is characterized by an intense to overwhelming obsession with the object of affection. Often these individuals find that their thoughts are dominated by the person they are attracted to. It can really actually get to the point where it interferes with their daily life and their mental well-being. They also may experience a deep emotional dependency on any signs of reciprocation. A crush, on the other hand, is characterized by lighter, more fleeting forms of attraction. While someone with a crush might frequently think about the person they like and feel excited to see or interact with them, those feelings don't usually reach the level of obsession seen in limerence and are less likely to disrupt your daily functioning. Now, in the emotional depth quadrant, limerence is characterized by a profound emotional investment in the relationship or potential relationship with the other person. The limerent individual will crave mutual feelings and an emotional connection. Oftentimes, they're terrified of rejection and the intensity of limerence can persist even without any encouragement of reciprocation from the object of their affection. Now, on the other hand, a crush in this quadrant is characterized by generally more superficial type behaviors. Uh, if the person with a crush senses disinterest or rejection, their feelings are a lot more likely to diminish relatively quickly. Let's hop on over now to the impact on life. Now, limerence is characterized in this quadrant as someone's mood or happiness becoming heavily dependent on their interactions with the object of their affection. Limerence also may lead to behaviors aimed at maintaining a connection or proximity to that person. On the other hand, a crush is often characterized by some of the same stuff that a limerence individual might be characterized by, but it typically does not result in the same level of drastic or potentially harmful actions. We'll actually talk about this later. The impact on your self-esteem is also less pronounced as the individual's sense of self-worth is not tightly bound to the reciprocation of feelings. In the duration quadrant, this is where things get spicy. Limerence is characterized by the fact that these obsessions last for a very long time, often years, especially if the limerent person believes that there's even a slight chance of reconciliation. Now, these feelings may only diminish when there is a clear resolution, such as a definitive rejection or the formation of a real new relationship. On the other hand, a crush might be characterized by the fact that it might be a little bit more short-lived or the fact that feelings will fade over time, especially in the face of rejection or lack of interaction. So when I started framing limerence into those four quadrants, one thought came to mind. I feel like I intersect with a lot of limerent individuals on a daily basis. So I actually got my start on YouTube way back in 2015. Jeez, that suit. I, I don't know why I thought that would be a good idea. Anyways, I was essentially creating content aimed towards helping individuals who want to get back with their exes. And I would say that I've seen my fair share of limerent qualities, things like obsession. Yeah, I, I was just in that desperation like phase, like, what am I going to do? How do I do this? Anxiety. 
But I was driving up to the wedding and I'm like feeling anxious because I know his name's gonna be on everything. And I'm like, I'm down. Proximity. I think I did everything wrong though. I had, you know, confrontation with the only wo the other woman. I had. And I suppose on the surface, this kind of makes sense. Someone who is desperately wanting an ex back and going to YouTube to search for advice on it will probably be the most likely person to exhibit limerent type of qualities. Yet being completely dependent on the result of successfully winning an ex back. Tying your entire worth into that can be incredibly dangerous. And I've seen it play out enough over the years to know that it can ruin your life. I had an interview a few months ago with Dr. John Paul Garrison, who is basically a clinical forensic psychologist based out of Georgia. He also runs the really popular YouTube channel, Dr. G Explains. Definitely check that out if you get a chance. Anyways, he said something particularly interesting in the interview. When you think about avoidant, avoidant is anxiety, really, because anxiety is built around the concept of avoidance. We can't be anxious and not avoid. It just comes with the territory. Now, on the surface, Dr. G talking about anxiety and avoidance may seem like it has nothing to do with limerence and the topic of this video. But what he's really getting to the heart of here is the entire concept of insecure attachment is firmly rooted in anxiety. Think of it like this. When someone with an anxious attachment style is confronted with anxiety, they cope with it by acting incredibly anxious. When someone with an avoidant attachment style is confronted with anxiety, they cope with it by being incredibly avoidant. And of course, when a fearful avoidant is confronted with anxiety, they actually don't know how to cope with it. So here's my theory. Most of our audience has an anxious attachment style. This shouldn't be news. I've talked about this in multiple polls. Now, I look at limerence as an extreme coping mechanism to deal with anxiety, albeit it's an unconscious and maladaptive one. Now, limerence often serves as an escape for the individual to escape things like loneliness, low self-esteem, unresolved trauma, or dissatisfaction with their current life circumstances, all of which are caused by, you guessed it, anxiety. Now, by focusing on the object of your limerence, you get these kind of interesting benefits. You're going to feel euphoria and connection or some purpose that distracts you from underlying issues or emotional pain. Yet beneath the surface, this vexation leads to a further psychological distress in the long run. So essentially, rather than dealing with the root cause of your discomfort or working towards healthy coping mechanisms, you may find yourself in the cycle of obsession and fantasy that essentially hinders your own emotional growth and development. And like I said, I've seen this literally ruin people's lives before. And it really happens across four main phases, the emotional turmoil phase, the impact on relationships phase, the personal or professional relationships phase, and of course the psychological health phase. Watch how this plays out. Let's say that I have a hardcore limerence over a crush. Who is my crush? Well, I mean, I have to choose my wife. But for the purposes of this example, let's pretend that we're not married. In fact, let's say that I like her a whole lot more than she likes me. Now, the first phase of how limerence ruins your life is, of course, the emotional turmoil phase. My constant obsession with Jennifer leads to a lot of emotional distress, including more anxiety, more depression, more mood swings. It's even gotten to the point where my preoccupation with her overshadows shadows, other emotions and interests, and it makes it difficult for me to find other joy and other aspects of my life. Essentially, I'm living for her, which is a total turn on, right? Right? Wrong. My crazy obsession with her turns her away from me. And of course, my love is unrequited, which just makes me more depressed, more anxious. And that's where we enter phase two. Now, phase two is the impact on relationships. My obsessive thoughts of Jennifer has begun to strain or damage the relationships with my friends or family. 
and it usually happens on two levels. I've either annoyed them because all I want to talk about is me and my feelings for Jennifer and how bad I have it that they end up walking away or getting annoyed with me, or because I am too consumed with my obsession, I don't put in enough time to nurture the healthy relationships around me that need to be nurtured, and those individuals start to distance themselves from me. Oh, and the idea of forming a new relationship or finding someone else? Come on. No one can measure up to Jennifer. Now we enter the third phase, the personal or professional life phase. My preoccupation with the object of my limerence sort of has caused me to neglect my personal and professional responsibilities. I've maybe a little bit underperformed at work and maybe got a little bit fired. Not a big deal though, not a big deal. This of course, though, caused me to get incredibly depressed and I stopped going to the gym. That rocking bot I was so well known for, well, it's seen better days. Jennifer is nowhere around me and I'm getting really desperate now. Like. I thought I knew what desperation was before, but now, well, I start to engage in really risky or inappropriate behaviors like driving around her work just so I have the chance of seeing her. Maybe I bought her a present that I can't really afford. It didn't work. Which leads us to the fourth and final phase, psychological health. I'm going to level with you guys. I've been through it. I've developed a deep depression. I'm obsessive, but worst of all, I've lost my identity and my values. My self-interests, well, I don't have any. It's all about Jennifer. I know it's not healthy. I know it's not right. I've lost my self-esteem and my personal agency. My life is ruined. I've seen this exact scenario play out with more clients than I'd like to admit, but I don't wanna make it seem like there's no hope or all hope is lost. That's not the case. It is very possible to break out of this cycle. You know, there's one thing that constantly annoys me about the internet. Every time I feel like you search for solutions, especially when it comes to self-help type things, you get a lot of basic answers. Like limerence, for example, would be reconnecting with friends and family, feeling secure in yourself in your relationship, accepting yourself, including the good, the bad, and the in-between working on growing your self-esteem, learning to identify and express your desires and needs, asserting yourself and developing and maintaining healthy boundaries. Those just seem so underwhelming. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're technically all true. But if I'm gonna be honest with you, someone who is suffering hardcore from limerence is going to open Google, see that list, think to themselves, yeah, that's a good list nod their heads, and then go right on back obsessing about the one person that they need to stop obsessing about. Essentially, they make no meaningful change. Now, for this video to have any kind of impact like I want it to have, we need to go beyond the basic listicle type answers. I want to give advice that I've actually seen work for individuals. So while all that stuff is technically true, you know, why you should accept yourself, rebuilding your self-esteem, identifying your desires, all that good stuff. I'd like to approach limerence from an outside the box perspective. Now, at the risk of sounding repetitive, I'm of the belief that the most likely individuals to suffer from limerence are going to be those individuals who have anxious attachment styles. Once again, I point to our internal polls to show you that most of our audience probably has anxious attachment styles. So if we operate with that belief, then it stands to reason that the best approach to overcoming limerence would be sort of the same approach to moving an insecure attachment towards a more secure one. In fact, this was one of the biggest points that I made in my last video, where I essentially studied an email from a therapist named Tara Spears. The TLDR is basically I asked a therapist to audit my content and give me advice on how to improve it. Anyways, she essentially made the point that one does not change their attachment style on their own. Attachment styles are formed in relationships, maintained in relationships, and reformed in relationships. And this was something that was further corroborated in an interview I did with Erica Komazar, a licensed psychoanalyst who studies attachment style formation in children. Like showing yeah. this is how the, you're safe. So the therapist is basically takes that over or a, a relationship, a relationship broke it and only a relationship can fix it. 
So a relationship broke it and only a relationship can fix it. You never see that talked about in those Google articles that rank really highly. But believe it or not, it was what she said before the clip I just played that I thought was even more particularly intriguing. And psychoanalysts don't like to use this term, but I'm going to use it because it's true. Therapy is an emotionally reparative experience. Okay. They it's don't not, like that? <laughs> no, because it's not the, it's not even what your therapist says. It's the relationship. It's not like there's some magic, you know, wisdom that comes. Sometimes there is. Sometimes there's magic that comes out mm. of your therapist's mouth and you go, wow, that's quite an interpretation. That's so right. Sometimes that happens. It does. But most of the time it is the emotional attunement of that relationship. It is the consistency of that relationship. It is the long time trust and a kind of empathy that you have never had in your life that is the healing of that experience. Not the magic, not the medicine, but the relationship itself. Therapy is an emotionally restorative experience. So in most cases, it's not even what a therapist says that makes the difference. It's the relationship that you have with that therapist, which kind of goes back to what Tara was saying. Attachment cells are formed reformed and maintained in relationships. And I think that lies with the problem when it comes to overcoming limerence in general. Let's go back to that fun little trip through my life being ruined with limerence. Do you remember that second phase? It was all about how my other relationships in life suffered because of how much time, effort, and energy I put into my obsession. Yet that obsession was a black hole. My obsession, my limerence for Jennifer was doing nothing for me. And the ironic part is the more effort I put into trying to win the affections of this person, the more I ended up alienating her. What unfolds is a vicious cycle. I put energy into trying to attract Jennifer. She doesn't reciprocate. I grow depressed and put more energy into attracting her. This not only freaks her out, but my friends and family now suffer for it as I push them away. And this cycle just keeps repeating, going around over and over and over again. Yet it's the very people who can get you out of this cycle that end up thrown by the wayside, your friends, your family members, people that beget healthy, secure attachments. So here's my argument. If you truly want to overcome limerence, it's all about putting a similar level of effort into the healthy relationships around you, as opposed to continuing to pour energy into a black hole. And some people do end up doing this, or at least I think they think they do. Usually what I see though, is they end up just changing one black hole out for another black hole. For example, maybe their best friend has a completely avoidant or anxious attachment style themselves. So the closest person to you is modeling this insecure attachment style and teaching you more insecure beliefs. So the more avoidant or anxious they get, the more anxious you get, which leads you back to obsessing about Jennifer again, nothing gets done. What you're really looking for is people to surround yourself that can show you secure behaviors. So healthy, secure attachments is what you need to surround yourself with. Because it really goes back to what Erica said in this clip. But most of the time, it is the emotional attunement of that relationship. It is the consistency of that relationship. It is the long time trust and a kind of empathy that you have never had in your life that is the healing of that experience. Now, if you don't have a person in your life that can do that for you or that you are convinced has a secure attachment style, then my best advice is for you to go out and find someone with a secure attachment style. It's not the popular answer. It's not the magic bullet. It's not even an overnight solution, but it is what works.